at the end time, there will be a one world religion. And this is the beginning of it. We are seeing it. It's in our, and why is it happening? Because remember, the mortal wound is inflicted on the beast with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. But today you don't have people that even know the word of God. How, how did you know the word of God when you were a kid? You memorized it. In Sunday school class, you memor- You can't memorize it anymore because everybody's got something says something different. All the translations say something different. It's deliberate. It's to prevent you. And then, you know, you, you, I used to think it was really good that they had all these study Bibles. But now I realize that the study Bibles are filled with all these footnotes and the footnotes always generate unbelief. See, if you just read the scripture and you say, this is the word of God, I may not understand it, but it's the word of God. But then they say, they'll say things like, for instance, have you ever seen this? There's a footnote that says, you know where it says in his, in the, in the, his number is 666? Yeah. Do you ever see a footnote in the Bible that says, some versions say 616? Hmm. Some manuscripts said 616? Who do you think came up with that? And that's what it does. It generates, it generates unbelief in the Word of God. You don't need all these footnotes suggesting this manuscript says this or this manuscript. You've got the word of God. You also had the independent church voice was now dead. What do I mean by that? We have been called to to have a faith in God independently. It's me with God. See, I have a pastor... But my relationship with God goes beyond that. I hear what you preach and then I go back and say to God, is that right? And every one of you should. Because in the end, when the books are open, the pastor's not even going to be standing there with you. I'll be standing there with you. In the same line. <laughs> We're all in the same. That's right. And nobody's, I've said this before, nobody's perfect. Right. Nobody has perfect understanding. And so he's, he's basically in the same boat you are. Servant. All he, he has a commission to be a pastor, a gift to be a pastor. And that's his role and responsibility. And he will be judged how he does it. But he stands on that pulpit. He's not 100% right. I stand up here. I'm not 100% right. I don't claim to be 100% right. The scripture says we prophesy. We know in part. We prophesy in part. But I'm going, I'm telling you in the judgment, when the books are open, John's not standing there with me. Now, now John could, John could say, but, but Jesus, this is what Ron told me. And he's going to say, Ron, who? Did I tell you to listen to Ron? Or did I tell you to listen to the word of God? Why do you think I gave you the book? The problem is we don't read the book anymore. Well, no wonder why we don't read it. There's so many different versions out there. We can't, we don't know which one's right. I had this problem and I didn't see. You, you have these Remember I said, one of these things goes with the other, and some things don't go. And, and long ago, when I, first, when, I, when I first came into Christianity, I went to the bookstore at the mall. I told the Lord in prayer, I said, I'm going to go to the mall, and you are going to direct me to the right Bible, because I have no idea which one is the right one. And I thought when I got there, there'd be like three or four different translations. Boy, was I surprised. There must have been a hundred different (laughs) translations that you could get. I don't know. Maybe I'm exaggerating at the time. I'll tell you what, there's thousands of them today. I mean, English, thousands. Why do you need thousands? It's a big market is what it is. Everybody wants a piece of the action. And here's the thing. Can I, can I print a King James Bible? 
Yes, it's public domain. I can't make much money off it. Because if I print it and I try to sell, sell it too, too, too expensive, you can just come in, undercut me. But if I have the copyright, if I own the NIV, you can't get an NIV except through me. You can't get a New American Standard except through that owner. You can't get a Zondervan Amplified. You can't get that translation except you go through them. Anyway, back to my story. So I go into this bookstore, and you know I, they had Bibles all over the place. It was a Christian bookstore. And, oh, Lord God, show me which one. I'm just going to close my eyes. I opened them, and I saw the one. It had a cross on it, and it said, The Jerusalem Bible. And I said, the Jer- It's got to be right. Jer- it said Jerusalem, right? It's got to be the right. Now, that's the stupidest way to go and, and choose your translation. But I didn't know any better. So I get it home, and it was, it was great, big, thick study Bible. I mean, it was that thick. I get it home. I notice in the preface, you know, when you were actually before that, when you first turn it open, there's like a little, it tells you who the publisher is. And it's a, the Douay version of the scripture. Anybody knows what that is? Catholicism. Catholic publishing was the most famous or the, or the best Catholic study Bible that they made. That's what I bought. And I even prayed. Now, I didn't have a lot of faith because I got there and I got to go close my eyes and look. And all, it said Jerusalem. It had to be the right one. Well, it turned out, it, it, for me at the time, it really, it really was what I needed. But... I would have been much better off grabbing up the King James. Because here's the thing, they haven't tampered with it. Why do I keep going back to that? I don't know. But anyway, the independent voice was now dead. You could not have church in your home. You had to have church with the clergy. And what else happened, you know, today, you know, it's marvelous, the the, the liberty we have because... We can decide, we can come, we can try Pastor, you know, Pastor Ed's preaching the church of God. We can go try the church down the street. We can go church, you know, because we're looking for a church. But you, you couldn't do that anymore. See, the, all the churches must agree with the council or be forced underground. You heard about all these Christians underground in Rome in the catacombs and they're, they, they were they were trying to to seek a place where they could be free to teach the truth as it had been revealed to them to teach the word of God at the council of of Gangra, which was presided over by Emperor Constantine. It became a matter of canon law that if anyone should hold private assemblies outside of the church i 'm quoting actually from the canon scripture here or the canon law if anyone should hold private assemblies outside of the church and despising the canons shall presume to perform ecclesiastical acts, the presbyter with the consent of the bishop refusing his permission, let him be anathema. What is anathema? Condemned. Hmm? Condemned. Condemned? Anathema. Judged guilty and, and for death. You committed a sin worthy of death. No longer was the layman allowed to hold private assemblies or gatherings in his home. Everything would come under the eye of scrutiny so that they might readily detect any amount of unconformance. At the the Synod of Antioch in Ancanus, Ancanus, I think it's pronounced, in AD 341, it was forever written in Canon 1 that, quote, whoever shall presume to set aside the decree of the Holy and Great Synod 
which uh, was assembled at Nice in the presence of the pious Emperor Constantine, beloved of God, concerning the holy and salutary Feast of Easter, if they shall obstinately persist in opposing what was then rightly ordained, let them be excommunicated, cast out of the church. This is said concerning the laity. You know who was the biggest resistance to uh, to the the whole thing about exchanging Passover for Easter? You remember John the Apostle? You remember he fits in here somewhere, right? He wrote. He was the last living apostle. Wrote the Book of Revelation. He lived in Ephesus. When he, when he, after he wrote the book, he went back to Ephesus. He lived there. In fact, Mary lived with him. Remember, he was the one who took care of Jesus' mother. When they, when they began to make this change, the church of Ephesus rebelled against them. They said, whoa, 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 whoa. We know what John taught us. See, John, John, it wasn't that long ago. John had, a, you know, he had a disciple who had a disciple. They were not that far removed. He said, John taught us to keep the Passover. They didn't want you to do anything that was Jewish. The edict came and said, no, we're going to celebrate it. It has to be on, on Sunday. So they changed the whole cost. The, I mean, what is, what is our salvation is the Passover lamb. Wouldn't it be better to, te to teach your kids about the Passover sacrifice than change it to a custom that was named after the goddess Ishtar? This causes confusion. But anyway, they rebelled against it. But I mean, uh, if you, if you um, did not agree with them, you could be excommunicated. Well, that's, that's a real problem. Because remember, at first, the church, the church was open to everybody. But then it became a law. You must be a member of the church. So what, if you must be a member and you've done things to be excommunicated, you're in, you're in bad shape. Because the law says you must go to church, and the church excommunicated you. So once again, you're worthy of death. Unless you repent and confess, go to confession. Or you know, I don't think the, the confessional didn't exist at that time. Uh, let's go to the now. There, this next, uh, this next pope, Sericius. In uh, 395 through 398, he was the Bishop of Rome. Uh, he wanted worldly power. He claimed universal jurisdiction over the church. Now look at this. He's, he makes this claim. Now remember, we had the Bishop of Rome. The Bishop of Rome was claiming he was the Bishop over Rome. And he had extra authority because Constantine put him in that position. But now... Now here he comes around, the Bishop of Rome, this new Bishop of Rome, and he says he has jurisdiction over all the church throughout the whole world. You can see the beginnings of the papacy, right? And in that time, the empire became much divided. You heard of the division and the fall of the Roman Empire. It actually happened in his day. The East was beset by controversies, primarily the whole Iranianism thing. The West was breaking up before the barbarians, or barbarous barbarians. Oh, I said barbarians, barbarians. That must be some really bad barbarians. Or it's a misprint. You can see here the division of the actual Roman Empire here and what began with Constantine moving his throne to Constantinople actually ended a few years later. It's only 70 years after this where it actually became two separate empires, the East and the West. They were both Rome, the Roman Empire, but one was the East, one was the West, right? Well, actually, uh, uh, it, it later becomes a, the, Byzantine, you heard of, the Byzantine Empire. That's what it becomes later on. But remember, the, remember we saw the image and it had the two legs? It was split, right? So this, this is where the split occurred at that time period. This is the, what, what's considered to be the first 
real pope in 440, 461. Uh, problem was, he didn't wield the power because of the division of the empire. So nobody, the people really didn't uh, listen to him like they, like they should. Uh, we have a slide here that says some stuff about him. Obtained from Emperor of Valician at the time, Valician III, imperial recognition for his claim as primate of all bishops. In other words, primate being not monkey, but uh, primate being first, okay? Uh, 452 AD, he pers per persuaded Attila the Hunt to spare the city of Rome, so he was a real good uh, negotiator, a real good uh, diplomat. 455 AD, he in, uh, induced uh, Genseric the Vandal to have mercy upon the city of Rome. So you see, all these barbarians are coming to attack Rome, he, and his reputation had been made. He declared himself Lord over the entire church. He advocated exclusive universal papacy, and he proclaimed the resistance to his authority was a sure path to hell. And this really is the beginning of the papacy, except he really didn't have the authority because they still had too much resistance um, in the in the church with the uh, the whole Iranianism thing, we're going to go to Daniel chapter seven verse eight now, back to the scripture, and we read here. Remember, this comes from the prophet Daniel. Remember, he saw how many beasts did he see rise up? Four. <laughs> Give the man four. What was it? He had the lion, the bear, the bear, leopard. And this one with ten horns. Okay, so so we read in Daniel, he says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up uh, among them another little horn. How many horns we got? We had ten. Another one came up. We have eleven. Okay. So this horn came up. And you can see he's actually got a, a mouth speaking blasphemy here. That's a nice cut and paste job, don't you think? But uh, so this horn came up among the ten. The scripture says another little horn came up before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. What happens? What happens when you uh, go out and you do your gardening, and the uh, Lord gets mad at me about this, and you pull it? You pull out the weed, but you don't get the roots. It's going to come back, right? You got to get the roots. But what happens when you pull them up by the roots? These horns aren't going to be there anymore. They're not going to come back, right? It says that they're plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man. See his eyes? And the horn and in the picture, and a mouth speaking great things. Now just because he says it was great doesn't mean it was the word great. It means great was uh the word great is like uh could be magnificent, um large. The the idea great is not a, in quality, but uh uh, just uh, could be unbelievable things he was saying. Or really what's intended here is blasphemy. Okay? And I beheld, we're still, we're still talking about, I beheld till the thrones were cast down. Now, the fourth, we just saw the fourth beast rise. He has ten horns. Incidentally, the, the beast represents the Roman Empire. We know that. Okay, we, we said that in previous uh, in previous classes here. Uh, you can go back and listen to uh, some of that if you if you want. But we already identified that this was the Roman Empire coming up. Another horn comes up. Three of the other horns were plucked out. What could these ten horns be? I don't know. We're, we'll get but I beheld to the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit. Who is the Ancient of Days? God himself, right? Whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as, as burning fire. And a fiery stream issued and came forth from him thousands, a thousand thousands. How many is a thousand thousands? 
Is that a million? So a million. Now I don't, I don't, I don't really think when it says a thousand thousand, I just think it is really a whole lot. I don't think we can say there's a million as opposed to a million and one. I think he just means there's a lot. You know, almost couldn't be counted. He says, a thousand thousand ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, and the judgment was set, and the books were open. We got the day of judgment. You see, when the judgment occurs is after the rising. First, the beast has to rise, and we said that's the Roman Empire. Then ten horns has to come up, then a, another horn has to come up and tear down three of the original horns. All this has to happen before the day of judgment. Well, take place in the three and a half years. Because isn't the small, the, the, new, the little horn, the Antichrist is going to crush the three other horns, which are three nations. But I thought that that happened uh, during the three and a half years. Okay, and remember prophecy. The thing about prophecy... There's a there when 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 there, you have the prophecy you have the immediate fulfillment, right. and then you have the future fulfillment, and so yes, and no, yes it will happen in the future, but it's already happened in the past, and so if we see what happened in the past, we you know we see then how we see the pattern. So the ne- we as we continue reading, he said. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake I beheld even till the beast was slain I mean the beast this beast is going to get his right the beast was slain and his body was destroyed oh by the way do you see in the background here in, in the beast do you see that woman in the background that's deliberate you know who she is Lilith, yes, or who we might call Babylon the Great. The beast is thrown into hell. Do you know um, in, in the Bible, in the, in the Revelation, it talks about the, the false prophet and the beast kingdom were both thrown, or the beast was thrown into the lake of fire. Well, you can bet, and it says Satan was thrown in there with him as well later on, after the thousand years, but you can bet Lilith gets in there too. Doesn't mention Lilith being in there, which is why I think that she might be the counter, the female counterpart of Satan, because she obviously is a being that exists. Anyway, um, so beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain, his body destroyed, his given to the burning flame. So it's it's not only a kingdom, but you see, he's got a body, and it's a he, right? His body was destroyed, given to the burning flame. As, so this, this thing with the, that speaks is great blasphemy. It's actually uh, also, uh, the, it represents the Antichrist, right? Which is kind of what you were alluding to. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Then I would know the truth of the first beast, which was diverse... We said that word is different. It's very different from all the rest of the beasts. This beast is different. In some way, sticks out. You know, remember that saying, sticks out like a sore thumb? It goes back to that Sesame Street thing. One of these things goes with the other, and one of these things don't go. This doesn't really go with the other. It, it's different. Okay, it's different from all the others. It's exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron. What what was the legs and the image made out of? Iron. So you can see the match up, right? He had uh, these uh, teeth of iron. His nails were of brass. Who who was represented by the brass? Alexander's kingdom. Remember the Roman Empire, kind of swallowed the Grecian Empire, right? In fact, we said that the Roman Empire had a lot, uh, they had, they changed, all their religion came from Greeks, right? They, they had a lot, all their tutors in the schooling of their, their children and everything, that in the kingdom, they were, they were Greek slaves. And uh, so he's got, there. you, you see the brass, uh, brass there too. 
So his uh, nails were of brass, and uh, in which he devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with his feet, and the ten horns that were in his head, and the other which came up, the eleventh horn, before whom three fell again. He says three of these horns are going to fall, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. More stout, kind of had this arrogant thing about him, this pomp, you know, it's like... Uh, I'm going to do things my way. It almost reminds me of uh, our president. And do you see the little horn now? Oh, is he cute? Is that the, you just want to touch him and go tickle, tickle, tickle. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. So, so we are told right, this horn that comes up, this horn is going to severely persecute the saints. Now, when the book of Daniel was written, who were the saints? Jews, right? There was no church at that time. So the saints were the Jews. So we're told that this horn is going to persecute the Jews, right? But it's also around, we saw that it, it, it actually, this kingdom lasts from when the time it rises all the way till the end. It talks about the judgment being set up. When it talked about the image, it talked about the, 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 uh, this kingdom coming and then the stone came and crushed the image and it fell down. And that was the Messiah coming to set up a throne, right? So when he says he makes war with the saints and he prevailed against them, I think what it's saying is he's going to make war with the Jews and he's also going to make war with the Christians, those are a couple identifying facts about this this horn. I think I think both has to happen. Until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the most high and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So there's the promise that there is a kingdom to possess, right? And then he said <clears throat> Or thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse or different from all kingdoms, shall devour the whole earth. In other words, it rises up. It says he's going to devour the whole earth. This kingdom, eventually it's going to grow to that magnitude. And he shall tread it down and break it in pieces, and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise and another shall rise after them and he shall be different or diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings. Remember the other scripture said he's going to pluck them up by the roots. You can see that you see uh, he, he rises up and you see the three horns here and it's all bloody. He pulled them out by the roots and we said if they pull them out by the roots they're gone. Okay. So something happens to this kingdom. It's divided into ten horns. Ten horns come out. Ten kings come out. And then the little horn comes up and says, I'm going to pluck three of these guys out. So what facts does the Bible say will distinguish the Antichrist kingdom? The little horn arises among ten horns, right? So we, we have that. Or... Ten horns represent kings or kingdoms or nations. In fact, you said, Nate, you even used the word, nations, of which three of them are plucked up by the roots. And here you have this picture. You've got the three horns are missing in front here, but you see, see them flying here, and they even have the roots associated. So they, they've been plucked out. This actually happened in 476 A.D. This is, you had Rome... And then you had, the, from the Roman Empire, you had the fall of the Roman Empire. But remember we said, well, all the way back to uh, when we mentioned about uh, uh, Damasus and Constantine, one of the things that were important, we have to get rid of the Arians. Hmm? Arians. And the guy, that was the guy's name who founded the sect, Arian, Arianism. These three... Horns or kingdoms were all er uh, believers in the Arianism. And you can see 
There were actually, here's the, I, I circled these, uh, and I even put the little, uh, the horn there, the three kings or kingdoms that were plucked up. The Ostrogoth, the Heruli, and the Vandals, they were all Aryan. Remember, Aryans don't believe in the Trinity. They don't believe Jesus is God. Well, if you lead them in the kingdom, they resist the, the, the introduction or the teaching of the Trinity. And what does, what does this beast want to do? He wants to introduce the Trinity of the Babylonian cult. Remember we said that uh, Rome picked up the Babylon, the Babylonian priesthood out of Pergamos. Remember they, um, they were in Babylon. Cyrus, the Persian, took over Babylon in the Persian kingdom. He ousted them out of the, his kingdom. He said, you're not going to have any part in this kingdom. They went to Pergamon, or Pergamus. You can say it either way. It was called either way. And that became the center of Babylon, Babylonian worship. And then when Rome came in and became an empire, that became this, this seat of worship. That's the place of Satan's seat. And that became the seat of imperial worship of, or worship of the Roman gods or emperors. Not only the Roman gods, but the Roman emperors. It was kind of the main seat. And that Babylonian cult then it was embraced within the Roman Empire the teaching was mother child cult you the father who is God the queen of heaven and the child who would be the son god that's what was embraced in pagan rome and this is what we had we had the pro pagan rome up until this point we had the pagan rome empire which is where jesus was born right he came in the roman empire <coughs> And then there was the fall, at this time, 476 AD, there was a fall of the Roman Empire. And these three were plucked up, what does that do? To make room for the next, the fulfillment, the, the next manifestation of this beast rising up. It's got to uproot some things before it can come to its full, this, uh, uh, fulfillment of this. Remember what I said about the beast? There's this one thing that uh, um, stands out about this beast was the word metamorphosis. It's like it appears and then there's a little change and a little change. It's like it keeps... And all the way down through 2,000 years, you can see it changing. It's changing shape. It's cha and I even mentioned where all, all of a sudden it becomes, you know, the woman gets on top of it and it becomes a scarlet color. And it goes through, well, scarlet color. When, when you see scarlet, what, what religion? It says that Babylon the Great is decked with purple and scarlet. Where do you see those colors? Catholicism, Rome, the cardinals, and the you know the the, uh, the, 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 the but when you see them in that when you see them in their in their religious they're they're purple, and it also says that she's decked with gold and pearls and and you can see I mean that 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 reeks of uh, Rome. But anyway, now remember we said that when these horns were uprooted. They were pulled up by the roots. That's what Scripture says. Notice the other seven horns. They still exist, don't they? This is what these, what these horns actually became. The Germans, the Swiss, the French, the Italians, the English, the Portuguese, the Spanish. All three of these have no... They have, they have no children. <laughs> they have no offspring. They were completely ripped out and uh, they cease to exist. So literally fulfilling the scripture, how they were pulled up by the... They weren't just pulled out, they were pulled out by the roots. And so this is where you get the concept. Many people have probably heard, many of you probably heard, where they talk about the revived Roman Empire. They talk about Europe, right? Well, we saw that's where these horns were. 
It all comes from the book of Daniel. That's why they say that the Antichrist will rise out of this revived Roman Emperor. But here's where these primary nations came from. What, so we can ask the question, remember we've been, uh, we had a slide like this before, we're, as we're going through this, we're trying to keep track of what facts do we see from, these, from the prophets, uh, so we can know how do we identify this, this kingdom or this beast kingdom. Well, here's some facts. He has to be some kingdom that plucks up three horns by the roots. It has to happen. To fulfill the scripture, right? So you can't just come along and say, um, well, yeah, this horn was fulfilled by Moscow. Because this never happened. Russia wasn't one of the horns, and Russia didn't uproot those horns. It has to be somebody that was around when, when the Roman Empire divided into the ten nations and was around when they plucked up the horns. Muslims, Muslims don't come. Muhammad's not born yet. No, Muhammad's about five. So we're gonna we we actually have him in the coming up. To talk about. Him. But uh, yeah, so Islam actually comes into power in around right around six hundred after Muhammad gets his uh, supposedly supposedly is visited by Gabriel who hands him the book but who probably is the angel that hands him I, I see I, I believe he was handed the book we're getting off the target here but um, uh, to talk to it himself and thinks it's a dub, that it's uh, literally an anti uh, a demon it is he thinks and believes it is he did first. and he did at first wow. yes what? in fact he had convulsions and just like a demonically possessed person that this is historical that's exactly what I'm <laughs> that's exactly what but see i believe that the quran is supernatural i don't think he just made it up i don't think he's smart enough to make it up but Remember, I mean, he was in the same area as it talks about the spirit who is the king of the bottomless pit, who is called the destroyer. Remember, we, we said he was named Apollo. Anyway, so this, 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 uh, this horn has to pluck up three horns by the root. Uh, the little horn is obviously a man, right? Because he speaks great things that are great blasphemy. In fact, we'll see later on. He speaks blasphemy. So there's got to be a human, there's got to there's be a human representative there. Uh, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High shall, and, uh, and think to change times and laws. If this is Rome, Think about this. When Jesus came into the earth, the calendar was lunar. Everything about Israel had to do with the moon. All the feast days revolved around the moon, right? They had a lunar calendar. In fact... Did you ever notice in the Bible it talks about a year and it says it's three, equals 360 days? Well, we know it's 365 and a quarter, right? So how, how could the Bible be wrong? The Bible's not wrong. The Bible is going off of the lunar calendar, which there's 30 days in a month. It's times 12 to 360, right? But he seeks to change times and laws. What what? What does Rome, Rome is on, the, the pagan Rome empire is on a sol, uh, solar cal calendar, right? And then they came in and they confused, remember they messed up the calendar. This is why you don't, you don't really know when Jesus was born. We know Jesus was born and we know he was 33 when he died. So if he was, and we know that BC means before Christ, so he had to be born. You know, once he was born, it wasn't BC anymore, right? 
So it should be very easy to say, okay, well, if Jesus was 33, then he must have died in 33 AD. But because Rome screwed up the calendar, we don't know. And so you'll look at some of your, your uh, history, writers of history, or you, you study Bibles or whatever, and some will say it was 2 BC he was born. Some say he was 4 BC. In other words, what they're telling you is that Jesus was born four years before Christ. How could he be born four years before? Because they screwed up the calendar. Nobody knows. And you know who loves this? Muslims. Do, do you know, by the way, who loves the fact that we have a thousand translations? Muslims. They laugh. How could you believe a Bible when everyone is different? You say it's the word of God. We have the Quran. We don't translate it. Although they do. But they said that for a long time. We don't translate it. The original is in Arabic. We are messed up. But do you know we were not messed up until a hundred years ago? A hundred year, up until a hundred years ago, we had only one source. We didn't have all this confusion. Somebody's behind all this confusion of the, of the translations. I'm getting uh, sidetracked here. Back to the scripture. Uh, he changes times and laws. What are the laws? He, we know he changed the times. In fact, here's a time. He changed Passover, and now it's Easter. There, there's a time, right? A season, time, time and season, a festival. He changed the calendar. He changed from uh, keeping time from lunar, the people of God, from lunar to solar, right? Well, what are the laws? What did he change? Well, we know he changed the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. We know he, he changed it. What other laws? He came up with all these laws. From the time of Constantine till about, I think it goes to about 750 A.D., I don't know uh, how long it actually, but 30 volumes. I actually was, I actually had this thought that, you know, how, you know, you're going to, well, you do it all the time. You're going to preach and you, you always use these illustrations and, uh, which you do very good. But, uh, I had, I had this, uh, idea about illustration. I was, I wanted to bring in the 30 volumes and put them up here so you could see what that was to see the law that they put you under. And I want you to be able to come and open the book because the print is really fine. You would be amazed at how much you are responsible if 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 Rome, if if, if the Pope is truly over the over the Church, and you're accountable to all those books. But here's the th reason I didn't. I would have to bring in a card. Yeah. Did you have a question? How could they possibly expect people to know? All that garbage. You don't have to know it. All you have to do is believe the priest. You got a question? Ask the priest. He's going to dictate. He'll tell you. You, and you're not. In fact, you're not supposed to question him. He's your father. He's, He's your father. father. Remember, Luke. Yeah. I am your father. The people in the church nowadays, the really devout Catholics, they believe this malarkey, lying. You know, hook, line, and sinker. What the Pope says is it. He is the Almighty. He is the Pope. And don't you dare cross him because he right. is the man. Yeah. They believe the wow. church is going to get you to hell. The they even believe. I mean, let's go to it. Let's let's carry it to its extreme. When he he, you know, he literally has a throne. Yeah. And when he sits on that throne. They say he is infallible. In other words, it is impossible for him to make a mistake. When he sits in the Pope's chair and he makes a decision or a law or whatever, he also has the power, according to Catholic, we'll look into some of this, but uh, I mean, quote right out of their, their own literature. He has the authority, it says in their own literature, to change any law, any precept, any scripture. And he has many times. And he does, yes. And here's the thing about this infallibility. Do you know, the popes 
you know, there's one pope and then the next pope. And then. So one pope comes along and he says, I'm infallible and I say this is the way it is. The next pope says, I'm changing that. And by the way, I'm infallible. I can't make a mistake. So now we're going to, you know, I, I'm just going to use this as an example. You have to eat fish on Friday. Oh, no, you don't have to eat fish on Friday. Well, both are infallible. Who are you going to believe? The one that says all you can eat. <laughs> Why you say all, all you can eat buffet? Yeah. I'm with you, John. That's what it's like. Uh, <laughs> he said it's all good. It's there will be all you can eat fish on Friday. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's that's a whole infallibility thing, and 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 they go along with it. It's just it's amazing, and we'll we'll may, maybe get some, I, you know. And I can't when I say we're going to do this, and we're going to. I don't know what we're going to do next week. I don't know. I don't know what's happening until I get there. So don't don't want me to do it. John, listen to Ron when he says that they want you to be stupid. In other words, you will yeah. not know any of this stuff. You won't say nobody knows. Uh, they're, they're not the, the the basic lay person really knows very little about the Catholic Church. In fact, Catholic priests. If you are what the Bible says. If you are Catholic and you ask and you you you, you had an audience with the Pope and you said, "How could you when the Bible says, "Don't add to my word or take away," how could you remove the second commandment from the 10 commandments? You know what his response would be? I have that authority. I'm the Pope. As a child, I mean, I sat there and I had a, a a feeling, you know, looking around all this stuff in the church and, you know, the nuns' teachings and stuff, that there's something just isn't right. Mm-hmm. One of those things goes with the other. Yeah. And you're right. As a, as a, a child, because when we're children don't know to lie until they're taught to lie later on. But anyway, back to this. I mean, here, this is kind of frightening. Not only will it change the times and the law. And, you know, as you're reading this, keep in mind, well, who's Daniel talking about? Who cha- who, di- who was in this position? Who was there when the three, three horns were uprooted? The three nations? Who, who changed the calendar? Who made all these laws? Look at the next thing. And, uh, and uh, he'll wear out the saints of the Most High, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Does that, um, does that sound familiar? A time, a time, and a dividing of time? Where does that come from? Revelation. Revelation says that. A time, a time, and a dividing of time, or something. A time and a half. A time and a half, yeah, something. It's the same thing. If you look at it, it's, it's almost word for word. What it means is three and a half years. times. Okay, and, and three and a half years, three and a half times. Um, it also talks about 1260. Well, what's 1260? 12, it says 1260 days. Well, what's that? Three and a half years. Or it says 42 months, 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years. It's all the same thing. Time, time, and it's their time. That's the Jewish calendar, not our days. And their days are whatever. I think their time span is shorter or longer. This is a little. Well, it's a little bit, but they all they used to have. A, they used to throw in another month every so often because. Remember, it, go, it goes according to the, the lunar, the actual moon is the clock. And they threw in another moon or another month to uh, another 30 days to adjust it. That's why it doesn't happen on the same day. Like Passover doesn't come on the same day every week or every year. Because it's, it goes according to the moon and it begins, at, the month begins at a certain time at the, at the new moon is when the... The three and a half years very well could would not be the same distance of, of space and time what we would consider three and a half years. Right. Because we would go, what, the solar calendar is 365 days. There's is 360. However, even in the book of Revelation, that's why they say it has a very Jewish character to it because Rome was under a solar 
you know, the solar calendar, 365 days, they knew there was 365. Yet the by the book of Revelation said 360 days. Why is that? See, you'll have people that'll laugh. They scoff. They say, look at the Bible. And you, you believe the Bible, and yet it doesn't even know there's 365 days in a year? They're the idiots. You know, but they, they, it's a, that misunderstanding. So anyway, so that's what it means. A time and times and a dividing of times. Then he says, but the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey him. What's he talking about? He's talking about millennial kingdom, right? Now, the cool thing about the millennial kingdom, who's going to be in the millennial kingdom? Well, the Jews are going to be there. And the church is going to be there because even though we're raptured into heaven, we rule and reign with him a thousand years on the earth, right? So we're going to be in that kingdom. Let's go to look at this. Now, now here is this. This is the most, this is what I think is the most, well, most accurate picture of the beast in Revelation. You see those heads? And all the horns are at, this is what I was trying to do with, with my cut and paste. <laughs> okay, is this a cool picture or what? But anyway, and there was given, this comes from Revelation 13, 5, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy. Didn't this sound like Daniel? Uh, this horn was given this great Things and but it didn't say blasphemy, but here's and blasphemies. Power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Forty two months. Do you know what that is? Three and a half years, which is a time. Two times and a half a time, right? It's the same thing Daniel said. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. We got one more thing I wanted to bring up here. I brought this up before. Remember when it when it talks about blasphemy, we said there's what define blasphemy? What is blasphemy? There the scriptures that define blasphemy is what Jesus was accused as blasphemy. He did two things for which they accused him of blasphemy. One, he forgave sins. And the other, he claimed to be the Son of God. And so here's the scriptures real fast. But he held it, and it's from the New Testament. He held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. He's actually referring to the prophecy in Daniel here. And then the high priest rent his clothes and said, What need we any further witness? You have heard the blasphemy. Because he equated himself to be the Son of this, he says, Out of the Christ, the Son of the Blessed, the Son of the Blessed. Who's the Son of the Son of God? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. Uh, my father which gave them me is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. This is Jesus speaking. I and my father are one. In other words, we are equal. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? And the Jews answered them, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. Because thou being a man makest thyself God. So you see, he, by saying he was God, by equating himself with God, that's blasphemy. Here's the next one. Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So if you claim to forgive sins, blasphemy. If you claim to be equal to God, blasphemy. Now, let's consider the, the papacy. 
Only the priest can forgive sins. Nobody else. Now, you cannot get your sins f- forgiven in Catholicism by going to Jesus or going to Mary. You have to go to the confession. You have to go to the priest. They have the power to forgive sins. That's blasphemy. God was the one that was forgiving the sins on the Day of Atonement. That was actually what was happening. But by the priests claiming in Catholicism that they forgive sins, that they have the power, they're equating themselves to be in the seat of God. The other one is when the Pope calls himself the, the vicar of Christ, he's saying he's in the place of or in the seat of Christ. He is equal to Christ on this earth. In fact, he calls himself a god. What is that? Blasphemy. So, the beast speaks great things. Blasphemy. Where else do we see an organization or a king or an empire or some religious or... Remember, one of the, one of the first things we had, we pointed out, it had to be a religious beast as, as well as a worldwide organization, and, right? It, ha- and it had to be a religious beast because they worshipped. We pointed that out. That was one of the facts. Not only must it be a religious beast of some sort, but it also has to speak words of blasphemy. In other words, by, de- by biblical definition, they say they forgive sins and they claim to be in the place of God. Where, where else do you have that? Where else? Do you have that in the Church of God? No. Do you have that in the Methodist Church? No. Do you have that in the Presbyterian Church? No. It's only Catholicism. Who else could fit this pattern? And today, the Pope is calling for unity. Over 50 million people were killed by the papacy through the Inquisition. They were also behind Hitler in the, in the destruction and the, the death. And they apologized. And they did apologize. The Jewish people because they didn't stand up. They, they basically yeah. did nothing. I, I actually almost really supported them. And they also apologized. They say, well, you know, as far as the Inquisition, we made, we made some mistakes. mistakes yeah. What about those 50? Now, and we haven't gotten into it, but if you ever look at the Inquisition, they... <laughs> They designed ways that would bring out the most torture. They, that's what they sat around and designed these thing, these things that would bring out the most pain and torture. Who does that? ISIS. Now they do, yeah. Yeah, but is that? I mean, who in his right mind wants to sit around and think how can I? T- even if you capture, even if you. If you don't like the person, cut their head off, fine. I mean, and, and the way ISIS, they're not the way, with a guillotine. Why should you torture them? And some people say, well, you know, how could a loving God cast somebody into hell? Because God has witnessed what they did for the last 2,000 years almost. Day after day after day, as these people cried out to God. And you know where there's a warning? It says, when it talks about Babylon, it says, Come out from among them. Be not partakers of their sins. What is that? You know what? That's one of the things, that's one of the reasons I came out. In other words, don't, what God is saying, don't be associated with them because they are going to be judged and if you are one of them you're going to be judged too you're going to be held responsible for all that they did so come out don't have nothing to do with them but now what we're do- and we did come out but now the people they, they're coming back in and you mark my word, and I'm not saying it because I'm a prophet. I'm just watching what's happening. One of these days, if you don't go join them, 
They will make you wish you had. They will drag you. They will reinstate the Inquisition. They will torture you. Unless you're not here. ISIS is pretty much choir boys in comparison with the Roman Inquisition. Yes. But at some point, I think they're going to join the guests outside. They will. The, the Catholic Church talks about that this church is one world religion that's going to persecute the true Christian, the true, true church. I was looking at that as a Catholic church. But you also see where, where the Muslims are coming into that. And like you said, they're, they're pulling everybody in. Even the, the Muslims, I believe, will be pulled. Oh, you know what? I started talking to that. Um, I said that the, the Pope claims that there's going to be... He, he said it's, it's impossible to bring this unity and the, these, all these branches back to Rome by human effort. He said, but he's not concerned about that because there's going to be a great movement of God, supernatural movement of God that's going to cause it to happen. Now... Think about this. What could cause that? Apparitions? What about when the Pope stands up there and calls fire down from heaven in the front of everybody? And he shows, like, like Thessalonians says, he shows that he is God. How, what are people going to do? What are they going to believe? They're going to run to him. The reason he's saying that, he's saying, look, who's got, remember uh, Elijah. And Elijah stood up there against all the false prophets of Baal, and he said, you call upon your God, I'll call upon mine, we'll see who answers. That's right. Basically, he's going to do the same thing, because he's a counterfeiter. Mm -hmm. And he's going to stand up there and say, can your Lutheran church do this? Can your church of God do this? I can. 